Hello, everyone. I'm Faduma Guri from the TCAF programming team. Welcome to our virtual program titled Kids Detective Comics. Before we begin, the Toronto Comic Arts Festival would like to honor and acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Haudenosaunee, and Yurong Wendat peoples. We are in a territory that was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon One Pump Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Haudenosaunee, and allied nations to share and care for the land. We also acknowledge that this area is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. TCAF makes this acknowledgement as a reminder that we are all treaty people and that we have a responsibility to the land and each other. This acknowledgement is a touchstone in our process of thinking through what it means to live and work on colonized land and is an expression of solidarity with our Indigenous siblings. TCAF commits to strengthening its relationship with Indigenous communities in Toronto and increasing Indigenous voices and perspectives in our programming. Welcome all again to Kids Detective Comics. We are honored to be joined by John Patrick Green, Nathan Page, and Drew Shannon. This exciting program will be moderated by Jillian Gertz. Thank you so much for joining us in this session of TCAF. Jillian, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jillian Gertz, and I'm the author and illustrator of the Shirley and Jamila series, Shirley and Jamila Save Their Summer and Shirley and Jamila's Big Fall, which are two stories about an unlikely pairing of crime solving friends who go out to solve kids ignored mysteries, including the greatest one of all, friendship. Now, I'm also today's moderator. I'm here with Nathan Page and Drew Shannon, uh, author slash illustrator creators of the Montague Twin series, The Witch's Hand, and the devil's music ba bam oh you got a book the books ready as yeah. well as john patrick green uh the creator of the investigators series amongst other titles and we're here today to talk about detective comics for kids so welcome everybody hi hello hi hi well, thanks let's Jillian. Jump right into the, hi hi uh <laughs> let's jump right into the first question so detective comics for kids we all came to this genre for our own reasons which i do want to get into but first i need to know have any of you ever solved a mystery yourself or been privy to a mystery and if so in a quick bite-sized morsel please tell me about it now <laughs> I, mm, I sorry john you go ahead <laughs> i'm thinking you go <laughs> i've absolutely been privy to a mystery uh, and I did not officially solve this one, although I have my theories. I adopted a cat from the Humane Society. Oh, this and is good. I, and when I went to pick him up, I was there for like two hours and he was nowhere to be found. The entire staff was searching for him. <laughs> they just could not find this cat. And then and like they, he was in a cage though, right? Like a kennel, an enclosure. Presumably, because I had been in the week before and I've been like, oh, this this is the one. Like, this is my little guy. The the name was Kipling, and I just thought like that was so cool. Um, so yeah, I went and when I went to pick him up because they were doing like the the uh he was getting neutered and getting his shots and everything, he was just nowhere. And then um like I didn't really, they didn't know what to say to me. They were like, we were sorry, we don't have your cat. And I was like, well, hugely bummed out, hugely <laughs> bummed out. So went home, got a call a couple of days later, like a, a friend of mine was calling the, the place absolutely like livid the entire time unbeknownst to me. But then I got a call a couple of days later that was like Kipling's brother was just returned. And you know, we want to, if, if you want them, like it's, it's completely, completely up to you, but he, he's here. And I've just, and I, I absolutely took that opportunity. Marlo, Marlo, the cat that I ended up getting out of this exchange is a, he's in the window right now, chirping at some birds. Um, but was Kipling a ghost? I just have to ask. Was Kipling a ghost? I cannot answer this, but I think maybe, or I think I actually have Kipling and they might have just <laughs> not know where he went. And they kind of just told an elaborate lie that I- Or do you think that there's, it's a situation of twins? <laughs> oh, 
Maybe Same. one is standing in for the other. Maybe you actually have two cats, but they're just constantly switching. Doing like a parent prestige. trap. Yeah, or a prestige. They're doing a prestige. Yeah, yeah. Or the parent cat. <laughs> I cannot but, tell you how much my mind has just been blown. <laughs> I also don't want to like step on John's toes when it comes to animal puns. We'll save that for a moment. Drew <laughs> uh, or John, do you have any, have you ever been embroiled in or solved a mystery? Um, nothing's really coming to me other than like the mystery of which room did I leave my phone in? Um, <laughs> which is becoming a you know more frequent struggle. Uh, I mean, listen, that sounds like a case for the investigators. Oh yeah, yeah, believe me. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure maybe I have some interesting mystery stories. I don't know if I have, I mean, I have a couple that I don't think are necessarily really mysteries just sort of bizarre adventures that might not be uh appropriate <laughs> um but nothing yeah nothing quite as uh mysterious as a, a, a cat a missing cat that has a doppelganger or is in <laughs> witness protection or something <laughs> that's that's wild yeah, I definitely don't think I have any mysteries. It's such a it's such a good question, and I wish I had something because I'm sure there is uh, in my past. It's just it's not. It's like the moment you are forced to think about a question like that, you can't come up with the answer. I'm so surprised Nathan was so quick on his feet because it was like that is a good one too. It's the biggest mystery of my life. I'm still <laughs> figuring it out. <laughs> I guess, yeah, it's still like a, it's a cold case. <laughs> it's never getting solved. No. Well, and I just solved the mystery of whether or not you all have mysteries that you've solved. So <laughs> I guess that's, that's yours. Yeah, that, that one's mine. That yeah. one's mine. Uh, but let's, let's widen it out a little bit. What brought each of you to the genres, the, the kind of co-genre of like kids and mysteries? Obviously there is a hunger for the mystery story, at least in Nathan. Um, <laughs> so what brought you to it? Uh, why don't we start with John? Um, I think really what brought me to it was just I had the I had the pun, <laughs> um, which of course you know I didn't come up with. It's like an old joke, like why did the chicken cross the road? But you know it's like what the do you investigator call an alligator that solves crimes? <laughs> an investigator. So I just had that as a premise, and then I said, oh, oh I think I can I can do some fun stuff with that. So I guess now I have to kind of come up with mysteries of some of some sort, uh, which I don't necessarily think are all that mysterious. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get better at kind of creating like um, mysteries for kids where like they can try to figure it out, like what's actually going on as as they're reading. Um, so that's. Do you just think you've gotten better at that over the over the course of writing the books? Like, um, I think I've just gotten more deliberate. Yeah. About it. Uh, Because really, the way I approach my mysteries are just what can I get the most jokes out of? (laughs) Um, Or what's just what's just the most wild and 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 bizarre sort of scenarios that I can do that have some sort of uh, 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 context of something is going on that we don't entirely understand. and, uh, you know, I think what, what draws me to that is that, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot that you can do with your imagination and kind of like uh, um, get the kid's imagination as they read going. Um, so when a kid gets invested in, uh, in, the, in what's happening with, um, oh, you know, they, they like want to figure it out. They want to know what's going to happen next or why did this thing happen or whatever, uh, which is kind of different than a lot of the stories I did previously. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that makes good sense. And I mean, listen, starting anchoring a career or a book around a joke, there's a worse way to, to start. That's a pretty, a pretty nice anchor point, I think. Yeah. How about you other two? You other two. Us two? Yeah, us two, Nathan and Drew. 
you too. Nathan? Mysteries. Um, I mean, I've just, I've, I've always loved, um, and you know, like whether it be, um, like Goonies and, you know, Hardy Boys, of course, and just, or like an episode of, are you afraid of the dark or something? Like, it's just always been something that really resonated. And I, but I mean, I think universally speaking that the mystery genre is so, I mean, it's just, it's so rife with opportunity because literally at every point in your life, everything is always a mystery. <laughs> it's just, it's really all context, but you can frame anything as a mystery, really. Um, especially as a, a, a kid or a teenager, like it, it just, that's especially a point where you're thinking like, okay, some of these questions I have have to have answers. Um, they don't, but <laughs> <laughs> they don't always I should say rather um but yeah I just I, I I think there's just a great um it's a great hook because we're all experiencing mysteries in any given day there's something it's, like it's, it's basically just the pitch for for Scooby-Doo as well it's like yeah bunch of bunch of kids in a van solve mysteries that's with the dog <laughs> like and like and how how long has that lasted right <laughs> you know so it's got appeal yeah. yeah absolutely and it's hard to pinpoint too because to me there's like an atmospheric thing about it where it's like if you want to tell a story you can put your characters and then you can put your creative self into uh kind of like a, a spooky sort of like I don't know. There's this. Uh, there's a question that needs to be answered, so you get to put yourself in a position of, "Ooh, I don't know something," and then I get to figure it out alongside the characters because I'm creating it. You know, so there's yeah. like something fun about that, like solving a mystery. Well, sorry, like writing a story is kind of solving a mystery. It's like what's going to happen at the end. I don't know, but I have to find out, like, uh, through somehow my own, our own like way of writing it. Well, and I think too, I sometimes wonder about the ways in which kids are so out of control and there's so much that they don't know. It makes sense to me that kids connect to mysteries. I mean, I guess that's not why I came to it, but also it's like the kid in me is interested in it as well, you mm -hmm. know, of just like, it's something that you can have control over and you can, you know, it's another unknown, but you're going to set it up in this way that there's going to be steps and you get to con you get to solve it. That's so rare. There's so many things that, you know, as you said, we don't get to solve. You just sort of have to live in this netherverse of accepting unknowns. And that's so frustrating as an adult. I found it anchoring personally to be able to be like, oh, this is a mystery that I wrote. So I know how it ends and I get to say and y'all have to listen. <laughs> Actually, that brings up a thing that John, you touched on, and it refers to the next question, which is the concept of solvability. I know that like creating a mystery that can be solved for kids. I feel like that's not, that's not what my story is. I sort of don't see that out there that much anymore. And I know that like, is that, is it necessary? I think it can be satisfying, but like does solvability matter? What other ingredients make the mystery juicy? What makes it a delicious sandwich? And does it have uh, something a kid can solve? I think for, for me, one of the things that I love, I like so much are, are red herrings that um, kids might recognize are red herrings. Like kids, I like doing things where the, the kid kind of feels like they're they're one step ahead of the main characters uh, because it leads to, it gives a lot of opportunity for doing humor and stuff where the kid knows uh, that the character is going the wrong way or something and you can do something kind of wild and fun with that. Um, the uh, as far as like solvability, a lot of times I end up in a position where. Um, whether or not the the mystery is solvable deter is is determined by if I have the actual page space <laughs> to put it in there, mm -hmm. um, because in the very first investigators <laughs> investigators book actually, the uh, the alligators don't solve 
they don't solve the mystery that they were solved uh, that they were basically tasked with at the beginning of the book they kind of solve a different mystery you know there there are two converging mysteries but the one that they were actually you know given at the very beginning of the book was to find a kidnapped uh a cupcake chef baker guy <laughs> and <laughs> and while I was making the story, I literally got to a point where I don't know, I'm at like page 180 out of 200. And I'm like, there's no way they're going to be able to save this guy. I just have to have him save himself. <laughs> so he basically manages like he's chained in a dungeon, a sewer, and he basically picks the lock with a spoon and then shows up back at his place of employment where the investigators are already and they're like eh, case <laughs> case closed <laughs> you know we, we found the guy and they didn't do anything and that was not intentional at all that was just you know i don't i ran out of space so i'm just gonna have to do it in a funny way <clears throat> so i think for, for me the the solvability or not is uh so long as it's entertaining it kind of doesn't matter one way or the other um, I think also a lot of times with, uh, there are many times when you're reading a mystery or even just any sort of narrative where things make sense as you're reading it. But then when you get to the very end, you start to go back and you think, well, wait a minute, this kind of, some of these things don't necessarily line up exactly. And with mm -hmm. mysteries, it's, it's hard, especially with, with detectives, because a lot of the process is characters just figuring something out internally. You know, they just come up with theories. So, you know, there's a lot of times there's no logic to a theory. It's just like, it's a hunch, you know? So if someone says like, oh, th this person's gone missing and, you know, a detective just start to be like asking all these different types of questions. It's like, could have been this, could have been this, could have been this. And all the, and only one of them is gonna be right, but you have to give, you have to show the character figuring something out. And so long as that can be entertaining um, and those distractions, those red herrings lead to interesting events, um, then that can make for a, a fun story. But then ultimately the actual mystery can actually just be a really, really tiny, oh, it was just one, two, three. If they only had, get, if they had only guessed that at the beginning, then you would have had a really short book. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Drew? Well, I think I was trying to think about it while you were giving your answer, John, because I think for us, a lot of it comes, a lot of our like storytelling in general is really character driven. So like hunches and stuff are important, but also like their relationships with each other and what they know about each other is important. So when you're trying to solve like you know, why is this person doing this thing? And we know this person, it's like, we have to kind of go and look at what we know about them, what we don't know about them, and then find out, you know, where those two things kind of have a valley and then, you know, bridge, bridge that valley to, to knowledge. But does that make sense, Nathan? Am I kind of? Yeah, buddy. That, that checks <laughs> out. Um, yeah. I, it, I, <laughs> I've had the benefit of um, listening to two great answers so far, but I was also just thinking like, one of the great things about the mystery genre in general is the fact that like every great mystery opens up to a new one. And mm. so that like, and especially if you want a continuing series, the real goal is to solve one mystery in a satisfying way while opening up to a bigger one. So to answer your question, yes, solvability is, is great and you want to you want to get that because you want that satisfying conclusion but ultimately you want another mystery to come out of it i think right yeah it's kind of like you know you can have a mystery that is oh someone stole you know a big giant diamond from you know a museum or something and then the mystery is at the start is just who stole the diamond but then they find who stole it and then the, the mystery becomes why like what you know was it just for profit were they building a super weapon that needed a, a crystal <laughs> you know mm -hmm. then it, it, it escalates and it snowballs and all that sort of stuff so yeah you, you can start small and expand and expand and expand yeah that all 
it's it's a funny thing because I do I think that it is entertaining for kids to be able to make guesses and sort of like use the clues that have been presented but I mean I, I mean at, at least in in my first book I definitely am like well here's a character you haven't met before and they're going to tell you a bunch of stuff so like there's no way you could have predicted that so mm. you know deal sorry like <laughs> This is where it's like, you know, the Encyclopedia Brown model of like everything's there. Can you put the pieces together is is in like nice work if you can get it. But I don't think it's imperative to making a good mystery myself. Yeah, um, we don't I don't think we really do it that way either. Like we we know kind of what we want to do and what needs to happen. And then we just work not work backwards, but we try to think of ways to introduce like well what do the characters know what do we want the characters to know and what do we want the audience to know mm -hmm. and then when do those things line up and then when are those things not and it's not really like well we have to make sure that the audience is able to figure this out before the characters blah 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 blah. it's always just like well what do the characters need to learn and do we you know i think the audience's perspective is usually from the character's perspective anyway so they're they're finding things out as the characters find them out um and so there's not really a ton of like, well, if you just looked over here, you would have seen this thing. And it's like, you know, yeah. keep the keep I mean, them guessing. Like those are keep them guessing. Styles as well. Like yeah. that kind of book feels almost more like an activity book. Whereas if you're trying to run something like a story with a character arc that has sort of like larger themes and things like that, the solvability I think is, you know, it's it's flexible anyway. Mm -hmm. Now with my books, I do. I, I have the benefit of being able to kind of take Sherlock Holmes mysteries and deconstruct them and reconstruct them and put them into the current time. So I get a little bit of a bonus from, uh, you know, old, old IP essentially. But uh, how do you guys go about writing your mysteries? Are you solving backwards? Are you, is it, is it character through line first and put mystery items, items in after the fact? I'm, I'm curious about the process of actually building out the mysteries like further to what you've already said. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I, I usually start with the jokes. <laughs> I, I start with like, I'll literally be like, oh, I want, um, I want a scene where a character, you know, walks in a room and gets hit in the face with a pizza or something. <laughs> Like, I will just have an idea for a scenario that I want to draw or I think is funny. And then I will try to reverse engineer something to get to that. Uh, the way I usually, the, the way I kind of think of things is like it's a reverse Chekhov's gun where it's not so much that if there's a gun, if you see a gun, it has to be fired by, you know, someone has to shoot it by act three. It's, it's the reverse where it's like, if at the end, so a thing is going to happen, then I have to, then I have to put it in the, then I have to set it up earlier on. Uh, that's kind of how I construct things. I just like thinking of like zany scenarios and then how can I make, um, yeah, like a mystery or a crime that needs solving or something around that. Nathan? Um, I think with that, our books in all sorts of ways you're seeing my work um <laughs> the the questions that i'm asking about the characters um you know before i go into the actual script writing process very much make it onto the page like what i what i think each of them are asking of themselves and of each other usually ends up making it in there but also i i mean seeing my work as an author and trying to um uh i you you really see some areas in which i'm i'm grappling with bigger questions myself like these are mysteries to me and they end up finding themselves into the books because i mean the montague twins are uh, the teenage versions of myself that i i wish i had been i wish i had been that uh, smart, emotionally um, open in everything. So, you know, as I'm figuring out things myself, they're, they're very much going into the book. I wish it was um, more nuanced than that, but I think at the end of the day, you're just seeing my work. 
But was your hair like that awesome? <laughs> never. It does get super no. curly and would puff out, but um, never that cool. Grow it. Come on. Oh, opportunity is right there. Oh, I've, I've seen it. it. I've <laughs> seen it. It's, 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 like, it's, I've seen it long. It's good. It's good stuff. <laughs> Now, wow. I guess this question is a little different for you, Drew. And I mean, this kind of gets into like what the process you guys use for writing your books, which is a future question. But <laughs> I guess I have a specific one, which is, are there, I mean, I guess the answer is just yes, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. <laughs> um, are there ways that you write the mystery into the drawings? And like, can you talk to that a little bit? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and... I think it really is um, the way that I try to use, I guess it would be like composition in a frame or like body language or how is a character reacting to something in the background of a panel if they're in the frame, but they're like the conversation isn't about them. Mm. You know, there's yeah. like, I think moments where I'm trying to just use like visual language to deepen like, whatever mood we're we're trying to go for in a particular scene um i try not to give too much like there's no like easter eggs or anything that would like help you if only you'd known uh if you'd only looked for it but it's like things that you don't know about in a frame like become explained later as the characters find them out so if you see like a weird box you're like well now we're gonna find out what the weird box is you know but i you know i have to that's like a clue so it's going in there <laughs> that seems like a really obvious answer it's like well i draw clues if there's a clue supposed to be there i draw it um but yeah i think i think it's mostly just through like um like staging and blocking and like you know character dynamics and trying to like show you know how people are feeling visually maybe um as opposed to just like you know showing like a clue or something yeah, yeah. i mean this is yeah i i feel like it's the books are really successful in that way in terms of the mood setting and like I think like the scene that le leaps to mind when you talk about this is when everybody's sitting around the fire and the devil's music it's just like there's something a bit ominous but it has this sort of teen energy but like you know it's like are you looking over someone's shoulder are you looking through something like those, mm -hmm. all of those elements can create that spooky mystery sense that Thanks. you know there's a little bit more to find out yeah um now actually here's a question for you owie ah sorry i just got a splinter from something that's a <laughs> that's a fun easter egg for the viewers <laughs> i don't like that mystery <laughs> no i hate it that it's you're like sitting on a raw ball. pallet doing this interview like a back of well, I'm sitting at kind of a makeshift desk where like a piece of old flooring is stretched mm. between two file cabinets, basically. It's um, the artist amazing. life is glamorous here, kids. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we live in our luxury suites, <laughs> surrounded by floor lamps. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Actually, that brings us to the question of um, comics joy versus comics suffering. So I, I think there's a lot of cash to being a comics maker on it or cachet, not cash. Um, <laughs> it's like <laughs> clear your cash. <laughs> I can tell you that's true. Say, where? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sure we all have found, I've had people like, if people are like, what do you do for a living? And you say you make comics, people are like, whoa, my dentist thinks I'm like the, like a space alien. He's like, if that's a job, oh my God. And at the same time. Meanwhile, I'm like, uh, can you do discounts? I don't have insurance. <laughs> and I'm like $700 for a, a bite guard for my constant writing from anxiety. Is that, yeah. is that a joke? Oh, you're a successful artist. You're good. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. It's easy. Um, so I'm curious about the labor of it. It like is, it, this is a multifaceted question. Is comic making a joy for you? Cause some people are like, I like writing. Some people are like, I like to have written. I like to make comics. I like to have made them. It's great when they're done, but doing it can be suffering. I'd, I'd like to hear about your experiences in actually making it workplace injuries, like the one I just sustained, the struggle, the joy, the emotional milieu, if you will. Let's start with Nathan. <laughs> I was about to be like, John, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, 
I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> All of it. Like it's it Panel is all over. We're done. Yeah, it, it <laughs> it's an absolute joy. Um, there's nothing that has I the, the way I feel about myself is completely different from when I started making comics. Like the the confidence, the um the just the the certainty in myself. I've never been so sure that it's what I should be doing. Um, it's also extremely hard. It's extremely hard and exhausting. And um, I mean, on top of it all, there's, 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 there's stuff that people expect you to do outside of comics, which is just really unfair to me. I don't understand <laughs> why. Like I, I have to do anything else but make comics, but I do. And so like, it, it's very strange hours. Like I wake up very early to make sure that I'm able to get writing in every day. Um, it, it's, but I love it. And I, I love it. I love it when I feel like the best writer who has ever put pen to page, which is some days. And I also love it when I feel like the worst writer who's ever put pen to page, which is probably more days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, do you want to hop in on that? Um, <clears throat> I I concur uh, with with with, the, with that uh, prognosis. Um, yeah, it's it's very similar for for me that uh, you know there's there's highs and lows. I think uh, when it comes to being uh, both the writer and the artist, the the writing is what I say I would have the most struggling with because the writing is sort of, um, writing is like coming up with a recipe for something, you know, like for a dish, when the drawing is the executing of the dish. It's like, once you figure out that recipe, for me, the drawing is just kind of just putting everything together. And that part just comes a lot more naturally to me, even when there are st still things like some visuals to figure out. Like I've always, ever since I was a little kid, I've been cartooning, you know, I've been drawing cartoons since I was little. And, but I always thought of myself as an artist. I always thought like I was a kid that drew and drawing was what I did. And even when I was like 11 year old, years old and I was making comics, actual comics, I never thought of myself as a writer of comics, even though that's clearly what I was doing. The writing just seemed like a means to an end. That was, that was just, I just have to, do, to get the writing done so that I can actually draw, which is the, the part that, that comes naturally to me. Um, and so the, the, the right, the, like they're both laborious for different reasons. Um, you know, writing gives when I'm having a bad writing day, it'll give me headaches and 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 stress, and I'll lose sleep or whatever. When I'm having a, a rough drawing day, it means like my arms or my back hurts. It will be physical pain. So there's like the mental pain and the physical pain. Um, but it's so incredibly rewarding. I, I find um, the like, yes, I do like the process of coming up with stories and creating the art, but the, like, the, the, I don't know, endorphins I get from having, having done those things and completed those things and being like, the writing is done and the drawing is done. And then finally a kid can read it, and, you know, and I'll get a Facebook message from their parent that found me <laughs> online being like, my, my kid reads your books. Like that, that is like the big rush where it's like, that makes it all, all, all worth it. And, 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 and so incredibly rewarding, but um, yeah, I can't, I kind of, I kind of knew that's what I was going to do ever since I was, little so i i constantly am just like hey i get to do what i wanted my entire life <laughs> so that's fantastic drew well uh i feel similarly to you john like i was like a drawer first and still am i guess and i <laughs> not a very confident writer hence why i found a nathan and I encourage every artist to find a Nathan. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that it's something that writing anyways is something that I've been doing, trying to do more of. And I think because I know I have a bit of a um, 
was just like a bit harder for me that I wanted to try it out more and work flex that muscle but like but I love that I get to just take Nathan's script and turn it into you know a finished project because it's like, even though we come up with some of the story together, like he definitely goes away and does the bulk of the actual writing. And it's, it's always like, I get to see it for the first time first. And it's really special for me because it feels new. And then I'm excited to draw it because it's kind of like, this is all for me now. And, um, um, and it's great. Uh, I think the only thing is that it is so much work. It's so much, it's so much art. Every process is so laborious. There's, thumbnails and there's sketches and then there's pencils and then there's inking and then there's flatting and then there's coloring and then there's like shading and then there's putting all the text in there and I do mostly all of that myself I get some some flatting help luckily um extremely grateful shout out to uh Joan and to um uh <laughs> redact this <laughs> it's okay buddy you're on a roll you're on a roll Keep going. I, know, I feel we'll so revisit. bad she was doing such a good job but I'm they both yeah <laughs> they're doing so great um and so i'm lucky that i have some help there but like it's so much work and and 300 plus pages and you know when you're in it you're really in it and like i can define chunks of my last few years by knowing when i was like doing the montague twins and was i wasn't because of just how much of my life it takes up um and i'm grateful that i can support myself outside of that with editorial work and other kinds of art and um have basically a schedule that I can call my own to do that with but like it's it is a lot of work and it's but it is, it is so rewarding and it's like it's interesting because there's this period where you're making it where it's like that's all you know how to do and then there's this period of where it comes out and you forgot that you made it like now it's like there's this separation between like what what the process was of making it and then the final product and like ha like holding it and being like it just transforms once it's bound um yeah yeah i don't i don't have children but i i feel like it's the closest thing that i'll touch to the whole like oh childbirth i have your friends being like it's so painful and horrible and then when it's done you instantly forget and you're like a cute baby i'd love one and I'm like, oh, a cool book? yeah i'll do another one it's <laughs> Like uh, never mind the the agony that I went through. <laughs> That's fine. Forgotten. Gone. So sorry. Joan Lee and Heather Mullen. Heather. Sorry, Heather. I'm sorry I forgot your name real quick. <laughs> She's so mad right now. So this is as as all of us now are makers of multiple books from a series, is there advice that you'd give your like book one self? John, that's the longest timeline for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a that's a badge of honor. You've got a uh, you know you have books prior to the investigator series oh, yes. as well. So get, yeah, tell us. Um, well, I mean, like drawing drawing book one of investigators was only like three and a half years ago. <laughs> Well, this we is it. I'm sort of thinking maybe back to your first, first book. Like... Oh, like my first, first book. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if I was, if I was able to give advice to myself kind of back then, I, it, it would be, it would be forget, forget the comics market and think of the kids book market mm. like we were just saying about how like oh you're telling people that you you make comic books and then you know you get those responses of like you can make money doing that or whatever if you tell people you make kids books then they give they, they, they're suddenly more interested they're like oh anything i would know you know they're like they, they want to know more um but of course that's just that's that's more like the career minded not necessarily process minded i think i think if i was to give myself some advice it would be more um just do just do what you would do naturally don't don't overthink it um you know i think that that's it seems like you found that to some degree with the like lead with the joke lead with the fun. oh yeah that's really like i mean honestly that's really putting you in the place of the possibility to enjoy your work the most of like here's a thing that delights me to work on i'll see that through like that's a that's a good way it's a good road to happiness 
Yeah, I basically, <laughs> when, um, when I was pitching the series, uh, I basically just got into this mindset of what, uh, what book, what kind of book would I like to make if I was 11 years old again? And so I dug out all the comics that I made when I was 11, 11 years old. And I just like I had in previous years, I had made a collection of them and just did some print on demand so I could give them like copies as a gift to my mom. And I just read through them all again. And I just decided like, okay, I'm just gonna regress to an 11 year old and kind of forget everything about making comics, you know, professionally or whatever, and just be like, I'm just gonna sit down and draw and kind of improvise some stuff and just make it up as I go along. And if I find it funny, uh, if it makes me laugh, <laughs> then maybe it'll make other people laugh. Um, so I think like if I was to give, you know, my, my career self, from like 10 years ago advice, it probably would, would be something like that. Like stop, stop overthinking the comics, just kind of do, just, you know, put more of myself into it um, Good advice. In, in, in that regard, I would say. That's fabulous advice. How about you, Drew? I think similarly, I would just, you know, give myself a little bit more room to you just take some of the doubt away but it's you, it's so much easier to say it in retrospect right you're just like hey like just believe in yourself a little bit more <laughs> you yeah. know it's like you, you you're doing this um for me i think it would be like something that i still have an ongoing issue with which is just like you're you're allowed to make comics like all you need to make comics is like a like two panels like sometimes less like you are there's no like comic maker like that you have to become it's like you're you already are a comic maker if like once you start making comics and you're now in you know a beautiful community of other comic makers and it's I think for me it's this feeling of like is what I'm doing like legit comics like I'm always wondering is this what real comics are supposed to be blah 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 and it's just like it's like, am I doing it right? Is it like legible enough? Is it like, you know, the way that you're supposed to do it? Who cares? <laughs> I mean, like, I think I would just try to miss like, it's fine. And I'm still struggling with that. But I think I would just try to give myself that encouragement, getting started too, and just because I feel like I would have made more comics, like, I think it took me a while to really start. Um, you know, I think it just was like, I doubted myself too long. And probably, you know, would have had more experience by now. And I think it's just like, don't like I made comics when I was a kid, but then I took, you know, it just didn't seem like a way to explore. I don't know. It didn't seem like a career at the time because I wasn't like traditional superhero comic artist. So it was like, well, that's out. But then, you know, I was like focusing on illustration and editorial illustration. But comics is like basically where I learned to draw. And so returning to that was hard because it felt like, well, like, this isn't what I was like taught to try to do with my life, but like, I really want to. So I avoided it for a while and I'm glad I did it, but I think I would have maybe just said, just do it. Just start sooner. Just start now. Just start. I feel that big time. There's the thing of like being identifying as an artist first is my story as well. And going up, going through school and an illustration program and this and that nobody really like hands you the, baton of comics and says now go do this and there is so much it, like you know everybody drew up grew up drawing comics it's mm. like every kid did every single kid and you stopped at some point because of messages that you heard but like to come back to that is a really beautiful thing um nathan what's your thoughts on advice that you'd give your your first book self I'd tell that Nathan to stop watching Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> Just every every time a new season comes out, it always corresponds with me outlining another Monty Twin <laughs> book, and we're pulling from the same zeitgeist. And it, <laughs> only Stranger Things is also in my zeitgeist. And I think they every time it comes out, I'm like they have access to my Scribner account. That's the only explanation <laughs> for this. Um, no, seriously though, I I sort of building on what you both said, what everyone said is that uh, I would just, I would, I would be really kind 
to that uh, younger self and just help them understand that it's never going, the book you're writing right now is never going to be the book that you would write two years down the line or two years before that. Um, you're doing the best with what you got. And I would just try to be really kind to that, Nathan. Oh, real sweet to him. That's nice. <laughs> now, John, um, as a dedicated pun user, I have specific questions for you. I want to know if there's any puns that you ever wanted to get into any of your books and that you couldn't or weren't allowed. That um, <clears throat> yeah, there was a, uh, uh, there's, I mean, there, there's a, a lot, but the one I remember uh, was one that would have been in, I'm trying to remember the specifics, it would have been in the fourth investigator's book. And so there's this scene where a, uh, a villain uh, steals a device called an embiggener. And basically he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to terrorize the town and I'm going to, you know, make big things for fun and I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to make big money. Um, and, you know, he shoots the bank and he, he makes a lot of, he, you know, it makes some big changes, change, um, the things like that. And there was going to be a part, and there was, I didn't even, this one I didn't even submit to the editor because I knew it was going to be cut anyway. There was, he was going to like do this to a bunch of different stores. So it's like he goes to a, a jewelry store and makes, you know, big giant gems or whatever. That's at least, that's at least makes sense. Um, well, I mean, he made a lot of sense with the bank too, but um, the, uh, uh, then he does like jumbo shrimp. He goes to, a, you know, he goes to a prawn shop and he makes jumbo shrimp. And then he was going to go to the post office and he's going to shoot like some mailboxes and then he get big mail and then say like, that's what I call mail enhancement. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't go for that? I, I, go for I, that? I, I did not submit that joke. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I was like, edit. this one's going to be cut. Yeah. Um, though there is a mailbox in the in the story, the mailbox survived, but the joke uh, did not, and it doesn't get it doesn't get big or anything. But like, I had already like I'd already started kind of like sketching the joke, um, but I at that point I knew I'm like no, no, no this, this one's not gonna. Uh, I mean, it could have been in the grand Disney tradition of like the artist sneaking some real shifty stuff into some of our favorite. Oh, comics, I, I still know? yeah. I still sneak a couple of some shifty things here and there. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, there are a couple that you you just know right off the bat. Like the one, one that they did want to cut uh, in the first book, they were kind of like, I think this is a little too suggestive. And I'm like, it, it was a, it's basically a, a, a Great British Bake Off um, reference it's a mary berry reference there's like uh you know there's there's like a clip of mary berry where she's criticizing a a cookie or a cupcake or something like that and she just says like the crack is moist <laughs> um so like so the first investigators book has a has like a baker and whatnot and a character that's that's testing like cookie dough and all that sort of stuff and i you know and i have them saying like with the crack is nice and moist um, and they were like, oh, we think we should, should cut that. Um, and I'm like, but why? <laughs> Is Mary bear a bear by chance in this? Uh, oh, well, yeah. Time? I mean, if, if I was to do, if I was actually <laughs> throw in some more famous, famous uh, chefs and bakers and whatnot, I throw, I throw a Mary Berry in there. <laughs> Listen, you created for yourself a world in which it's just like the door is open for unlimited jokes. And oh, yeah. I have to applaud that. Well done. Oh, thank you. Now, let's see here. I'm looking through my questions here. Oh, yes. Drew and Nathan. So I read that you guys met as co-workers and that's how you started off your co-creation relationship. Can you give us a little bit of that origin story? Well, it was a hot summer day and I was a Going in for a job interview <laughs> at this uh, at this fancy grocery store in Rosedale that's no longer with us, um, and uh, yeah, there was some cool music playing, and I look, I feel like Nathan remembers this story better than I do, but like basically, I was like, "This is cool music," and he was like, standing with his arms crossed behind the counter, like, "Yeah, yeah, you think so?" Like. 
basically the litmus test of like, okay, he likes this music or whatever. And uh, yeah, just trying to be, be cool. I'm not telling the story very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you are. This sounds like, uh, you know, men make friends 101. I want, I want to hear the story. <laughs> oh, no. And then, um, so what happened was basically I did get the job and we bonded over music and we ended up going to a concert together and shared some other like, just like like musical things that we like enjoyed and then just started hanging out and um yeah eventually I just asked him about this thing that I had kind of floating around in my brain which is just like I have this idea for a Hardy Boys ripoff basically <laughs> but that's basically all I have like I don't said, I, I want it to be better than that pastiche at least give yourself some pastiche <laughs> pastiche sure yeah I just thought it would be like an interesting trope a world of tropes to play with but like it was much, it was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. It wasn't what the Montague Twins is now. And that's hundred percent because of Nathan's contribution. But yeah, that was know, one, 10 years ago. Nathan, did you know Nathan was a writer going in or were you just like, this guy likes music. He can write comics. <laughs> uh, I, no. I think I, I laid some claim to be like, just to being into writing, like, you know, yeah. Uh, Drew was like coming fresh from Sheridan and all creative and stuff. And I was just a dude behind the counter with my arms crossed listening to cool music. I needed, I needed to put something out there. So I was like, yeah, I, I can write. Sure. I can write. No problem. I was like, great. I got a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're the guy. I think the people need to know what was the cool music. Oh, at that time. Nathan, you would know. Yeah, it probably would have been Danzig. <laughs> Absolutely, a little bit of Danzig goes a <laughs> long way. Um, no, I guess it would have been like spooky action. The the deer hunter guy. Mm -hmm. um, I I forget the actual name of it, but the concert we went to. Uh, where I was going to with a friend and I was just like, hey, do you want to come to this thing? Was Cass McCombs and Lower Dense was opening for mm -hmm. them. So uh, yeah, that's uh, a little peek into my playlists. <laughs> <laughs> Circa 2011? 2011, yeah, about yeah. then. Late 2011. I, I saw on your website that um, on the Montague website, what Montague Twins website, which everyone should of course check out, there was a bunch of playlists for the various books. And uh, that's actually an interesting question. Like how does music influence your process? So much. Greatly. <laughs> so, so much. Yeah. Like every, every page, every chapter, every character has their own relationship to music. And it, it just really, it's, it's, integral to how i i write the books um, music and... is our puns that's like <laughs> <laughs> i would say the way we could think about it we start with like music <laughs> probably to get the vibe right yep that's fascinating john do you does music play any role in your work or is it exclusively puns uh, yeah not really music like i can't even really work uh well with music going on um i need like for me, I need more white noise to, to, to really be productive. Yeah. Music ends up being like too alluring. It like, it, it pulls my concentration away from either writing or drawing. And then I, I, I you know, end up in this weird trance where I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Um, so, so for me, when I'm writing and drawing, it's usually, uh, I usually have like a, a, back, a TV show on in the background or something, um, or there are some podcasts that I can, I can, you know, listen to and, and, and work. Uh, there's, there's a lot of other podcasts where I can't do it, do that with, because they become just as distracting as music, where like, if you're not, don't give your full attention, you you know, you'll miss something and then you're constantly just like back 30, back 30. You know? um, so uh, like, you know, music, you know, I, I still like music. I still listen to music. It's just, and, and it's influenced me in many ways. Like, I mean, but it's not, it hasn't influenced me the same way that, that it did when I was like, you know, uh, in junior high <laughs> where like music was, you know, junior high and high school music was like, you know, a big thing. 
Um, now it's just, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really, uh, uh, you know, help evolve characters for me. I just think of, I just think of silly jokes. I mean, listen, a pizza in the face is one man's uh, deer hunter song. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, as, the, as the saying goes, as the saying think... goes, as the poets bake, yeah, the pizza in the face, etc. Yeah. So we're in our last five minutes here, and I just want to wrap up with a little like one last thought. Um, I've been thinking a bit about a lot of book bans and there's been a lot of pulling of books from library shelves um, and sort of a sweeping rage of, you know, book censorship and conservatism across America and across Canada. Um, and now one of the frequent targets of kids books that are getting pulled is books that have queer characters, books that have queer themes, and also not to mention themes of magic, themes of satanic, Satan, satanic panic, etc. And I mean, this goes to all three of you as creators. Um, do you have anything to say to parents, teachers, and librarians about what to say to people who are pushing librarians and educators to pull books from their shelves for any reason? Um, I, I don't think I really necessarily have the uh, uh, authority, really, or the or the actual personal experience to really give proper ad ad advice other than just that um, if there's any message to give it's just that denying denying information um whether it's uh, you know his actual historical information or if you if it's even just entertainment you like making those things taboo don't usually don't end up with the result that the people trying to ban these things want um, you know, and you can't change, and I don't think you can really change a person, like telling them, you know, you're not allowed to read this, or you're not allowed to be this, or whatever, you're not allowed to know about this. I don't think that's going to sway them, and I don't, I don't think anyone's really going to believe that. Um, so, I think of anything, just trying to, to instill this idea that, look, if, if someone reads something and they disagree with it, then that's fine. If they read something and they agree with it, that's fine. But the whole point is that the, the stories and the information is out there for people to access. And everyone's an in individual and everyone should be able to make those choices for themselves of, of what they want to read and what they want to be entertained by. Um, you know, the notion of we have to control what people are exposed to is not generally, you know, unless you're talking about chemicals <laughs> and asbestos <laughs> or whatever, it is generally not a good practice. Nathan? I would just tell them, I don't have advice. I would just tell them, thank you. They are, thank you for providing the books um, at, at risk of their jobs right now. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Um, there are so many, so many other hills, so many other battles that we could be fighting, but I would just say thank you to them for, um, putting not not just our books but so 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 many other incredibly important books into the hands of kids um and and into my hands when i was a kid as well i i have no advice other than to say thank you and um all the respect in the world drew anything to add i not much after both of those incredibly profound and extremely accurate ways of describing how I would feel about it as well. Um, I understand that other people's experiences may be different and, you know, scary to yours, but they are valid and extremely important stories need to be told from all kinds of perspectives. And, and yeah, I would just say we, oh, we are all going to be better off having heard those stories having, you know, had those people given opportunities to tell them stories. And I just, I can't ever see that as like 
a, a bad thing in the world. Excellent. And that brings us to the end. I want to thank all of you for solving the mystery of why is this panel so amazing? Thank you. <laughs> That's because of you, Jillian. It's truly, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> go on. Thank you so much also to TCAF for having me and for having all of us. And oh, and hi, you're back. Hello. <laughs> Um, thank you so much uh, to John Patrick Green, Nathan Page, Drew Shannon, and Jillian, uh, Jillian Gertz um, for sharing your insights on how you approach the creation of your mystery comics. Um, the path to creating an ideal detective comic is at times a mystery in and of itself. Um, and it's really cool that we get to witness accounts of your mind mapping towards creating stories, which then can fundamentally shape how your readers navigate a problem and establish their problem solving styles and i would even go as far as to say shape who they are right now so thanks for sharing your experiences um, wholehearted truths and wisdom uh, thank you all for joining us um, and tuning into kids detective comics look out for more of our virtual and in-person programs throughout the weekend thank you and have a wonderful tcaf everyone I hope you enjoyed that feature presentation for TCAF 2022. Before we go, I'd like to once again thank our programming sponsor, Seneca College School of Creative Arts and Animation. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Art Council, and the Toronto Art Council for their generous support. Special thanks, of course, to the Beguiling Books and Art. I hope you enjoyed the time. Thank you so much for it, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>